Hey everyone, it's Ross. In today's video, we're going to be talking about my 2019 garden plan. This is a really great time to be doing um, planning for the next year. You know, there's a lot of downtime, a lot of seed catalogs are going out. You know, you can get free shipping at a lot of places online that you can order seeds from. You know, this is a really great time to start doing some research and, and put in the plan because the plan is the key, man. I'm telling you, that plan is, there's nothing that beats a plan for an annual vegetable garden. Um, and I've done this exactly here in my spreadsheet, which is in the, the link to this is in the description of every video I've ever put out. You can go to this link and you can copy the exact way that I've set it up. There's probably better ways to do it. You can get more intricate with this. But for the most part, it's very simple. Every um, box represents one square foot. And some I've conjoined together, right? You can join boxes together in, um, in Excel. But if it's a row here, you know, this is one square foot, this, this area here. And this is a really great way so that when you're planting these things out next spring, you can realize where everything goes. There's a lot less time that has to take place. You're not scrambling to figure out where, what goes where, where I should put this. Everything should be planned out now. And then that way you're gonna have a much more successful season. I mean, there's nothing really that beats planning. So I recommend going to the spreadsheet here and copying this or using something like this. Um, and in this video, I want to also talk about everything I'm going to be growing in my annual beds. We had one bed that we had for two years and we decided to turn that over into strawberries. Uh, it was a lower light condition bed. So the bed was only getting maybe four hours of light. And you can grow things in four hours of light, um, annuals specifically, but I think it's more it's better for perennials and the bed was only getting afternoon sun and I've learned over the years that certain vegetables certain annuals really don't like afternoon sun certain things like morning sun a lot more it really is about the color that the the sun is putting out at that current moment in the the afternoon certain things are the the light that's being put out is really beneficial uh, for things to be flowering so if I'm putting um, things that I don't want to bolt in the heat, if I'm getting them, letting them get hit by only afternoon sun, that's really bad for the plant. They're probably going to be bitter in the case of lettuce, and they're probably going to bolt. So we got rid of that whole bed, and we're sticking with two this year. We created a whole new one. And another bed, we have essentially taken out the ability to plant many annuals. We put perennials in that bed. So we're really only down to two main beds, but let me show you guys what the beds look like for the most part. This is my main bed. This is the bed that gets the most amount of sunlight. And this is really important to think about when you're planning this out. We wanna picture what our beds are gonna look like and how exactly much room we have, what kind of sunlight they're getting and how much sunlight they're getting. This gets sun all day, all morning, all day and all afternoon. It's the south facing bed that I have here against the house. It's very warm. The microclimate here is very beneficial to plants that really love the heat. And things that maybe are a bit more sensitive to disease do really well here as well, as I've gathered over the years. Because the, um, the sunlight all day really dries the leaves and keeps those, disease, those diseases at, uh, at bay. So this is one bed here, which is this bed here that we're gonna talk about this whole section as well and then there's another bed here that we just created this year which I don't have a picture of I'm sorry guys but it's basically three feet wide by 14 feet long and this bed here we're planting a lot of figs in but there's plenty of room here because the bed is three feet wide we can plant figs um, on this side of the bed and then on this strip of it about a square foot of it going this way if you guys can understand what I'm saying. This is where you're gonna get the most amount of sunlight, about six to seven hours of light. And we'll be able to grow things in there that really don't need the best fertility, that don't need the most amount of water. Um, the, this is really a carefree bed that I'm not gonna put a whole lot of attention to. So only things that will thrive without, with, with complete neglect, I have decided to put in here. Uh, this bed is also not very nutritious. It only gets midday to afternoon sun. 
So there's only really a lim there's a very limited amount of things we can grow in here that won't take up too much space and crowd the figs. So uh, that's what we're gonna do. And in this bed, we're gonna grow mostly beans and peas and potatoes. Potatoes, believe it or not, don't need a whole lot of nutrients. The most of the nutrients comes from the sunlight and from the tuber. So if you have a large tuber with a lot of eyes that gets more sunlight, uh, you will probably get larger and more potatoes. The fertility of the soil is not really that important, and uh, you know you see that very apparently with conventional agriculture, how we've just continued to get larger and larger uh, potatoes and consistently. I know they feed them a lot and they destroy their fields, but uh, you really can grow potatoes in almost sterile soil, I promise you. Um, so, you know, obviously it's not something you want to do, but if you got you got the room, right? You're, you're running out of room and you got to put potatoes somewhere, might as well try it, right? So we're going to see how that works out for me this year. I've seen evidence of, you know, what I just said to support that from other people and uh, we'll see how it works out. Now, so this bed is exclusively for peas and beans and potatoes. We may try things like lentils and chickpeas. I'm not sure just yet, but I love snap peas, I love string beans, and I love potatoes. Oh, and soybeans are great for making edamame. And this stuff you plant and you literally don't have to water it, you don't have to worry about it. Um, it's the greatest thing. Now, moving on to uh, the bed that I'm gonna have kind of in morning sun. This is the bed we just created. We're gonna get a lot of morning sun. We're gonna get some midday sun and we're actually gonna get a pretty good amount of afternoon sun. So we are really getting all three. Uh, we're getting a full spectrum of light and we're getting a lot of light. And what I've decided to grow in this bed is things that don't necessarily need to get blasted with heat all day. We got breaks in the day. We've got it in a cooler location, not up against the house. It's definitely a cooler microclimate. Um, you know, things that are maybe disease sensitive can go here. I'm not necessarily too worried about it, right? So the first thing I wanna grow this year and the first time I'm ever doing it is onions. And the, the Walla Walla onion is probably the best onion most people would consider in Northern latitudes. Um, so picking an onion is very important. I would go with an heirloom and I would go with an heirloom that uh, fits your latitude, fits the day length of your uh, your summer. It's very important. So pay great attention to that. But if you live where I live and you live north of me, uh, you will have good success with Walla Walla. I'm also growing Mokum carrots again. They're a carrot that I find to be much better than any carrot I've ever had. They have some kind of distinct edge. They are probably a little sweeter than most carrots you've eaten. Um, I just really like them. There's probably a better carrot out there. I'm, I'm interested if anyone has any ideas. I'm all ears, but uh, so far I really like that carrot. It grows well here as well. Mizuna is a, is a mustard style lettuce that uh, people in Asian cultures really like. It's a Japanese mustard, and uh, I really am a big fan of it because I grew it last year, and I did a whole lot of research this year realizing that a lot of uh, Asian vegetables or Asian varieties of uh, annuals are just really well adapted to my climate. I live in a humid subtropical climate is what it's called according to the Köppen classification system and if you compare the Köppen classification system of a humid subtropical climate to other parts of the world you will see that my climate matches up well with lots of China and lots of Japan. So lots of things I've been looking for in those climates. I also really love Asian food. So me growing Mizuna is not a bad idea. I love mustardy type lettuces to add to salads. They're really good to cook with. Um, they also have a huge variety of different Asian vegetables that I've gotten into in, other, in an episode of Fruit Talk. But I've finally narrowed it down, I think, into what exactly I want to grow. Joy Choi is a type of bok choy. It has white stems. A lot of people use this for a type of cabbage. And cabbage for me is extremely difficult to grow. Brussels sprouts are very difficult to grow. And so is broccoli. So 
those are really the more typical things you would find in, in Western cuisine, right? And I love those things. I love Brussels sprouts. I love cabbage. I love broccoli. But I can't really grow them well here in a humid subtropical climate without really putting in a lot of effort that I'm not really willing to put in. So for me, these other things are a lot more simple. Joy Choi, which is heat tolerant, it's not going to bolt on me, and I can grow a really tasty cabbage, probably more tasty than any cabbage I've ever eaten. Um, a lot of the Asian stuff here, not only is it superior in my climate, but it also just tastes better than most brassicas you can find. And I think uh, there's a huge variety of brassicas out there that most of you probably have never heard of. It's really well worth looking into, the brassica family. I think that they're um, some of the best vegetables you can eat. I know a lot of you guys love the nightshade family, tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, you know, but brassicas, man, they are incredible and they do well. You can find some of them that will do well all season long. And you can grow more of them than you can grow the nightshade family in my particular climate. So I can grow, um, you know, brassicas in April and in November and in um, December. Whereas I can't do that with the nightshade family. So I can be growing and I should be paying more attention to things like that that are do better in cooler conditions. Um, and that's exactly what I've done this year. So... Joy Choi is one that is really bolt tolerant. It's actually a hybrid. Um, there's also something out there called uh, green stem pak choy, bok choy, however you would like to say it. But instead of Joy Choi, which has the white stems, this has the green stems. And a lot of people, what they'll do is they'll use the green stem one for leaves and salads. And they won't, and they'll, it's kind of like a spinach substitute. Spinach is very difficult to grow where I live. So is arugula. Um, I really love spinach and arugula. If I was going to make a salad, those would be the two bases of my lettuce. Lettuce is just very difficult to grow where I live. It's too hot. Things bolt. You need to get it really started very early, picked at a young age, irrigate well. Have it in a bed that gets only morning sun. I mean, there's, excuse me guys, there's a lot of requirements for lettuce. Whereas other things like mizuna, which are types of mustard, you know, um, Swiss chard does really well. Some kale does really well. Um, but I'm not really the biggest fan of kale. I like Swiss chard, but this year I'm probably not going to grow it. I'd rather try my hand at some of these other things like komatsuna and green stem pak choy, which both of them are used primarily for their leaves and can offer me a really nice, tasty spinach style leaf that, uh, may even have some mustardy type flavor in it. So moving on, um, we're also going to grow things like Choi Sum and Kailan, Gailan, however you would like to pronounce it. Um, these things are very similar to those of you who may know of uh, broccoli rab or rapini or um, asparagus broccoli. These are things that send up these spears uh, and you kind of harvest the broccoli plant, a small head of broccoli most of the time it's not even a head it's just flowers and it's very very sweet unlike broccoli rob uh, there's no bitterness um, it's very very good I like broccoli rob for the bitterness personally it adds a nice element to cooking but choice some and the two varieties I've chosen here is suiho and uh, or suho however you want to pronounce it and I don't know how to pronounce this one but they're all types similar to broccoli rob gailan kailan it's really worth looking into, guys. I suggest you do that. Um, I have some other things over here that I was considering, and I'm going to put these this stuff in different locations. We're going to grow a, um, a current-style tomato that really likes to go wild, and it likes to self-propagate itself every year. So we're going to kind of develop a tomato patch and let this thing do its thing. Um, we're also going to grow some Aztec broccoli. And those of you who don't know what this is, it's called Huizontal. It's very popular in Mexico. It's also very, it's a uh, thing very similar to um, hmm, quinoa. So it's re related to quinoa, but you harvest the heads of the quinoa and it's actually very similar to asparagus or broccoli in flavor. So a really easy to grow. Quinoa is super easy to grow. Way easier to grow than all this stuff. 
You plant quinoa, you let it go, and it's you're done. I mean, that's how simple it is in my climate. And if I can get it to taste good in the form of Aztec broccoli, yeah, I got something here. I got something. Um, I may grow Swiss chard. I'm going to grow basil, parsley, and oregano. We got to put those, we got to find spots for that stuff. Borage, I'm not going to eat, but we're going to propagate this and kind of have that for the bees. We're probably going to find a spot for ginger, and we're going to probably find ourselves some turmeric plants and plant those maybe somewhere. Chamomile as well. You can get Roman chamomile that is hardy to zone six, I believe. That will be a perennial. Yokata na is another Asian green that I really, really like that does well here. Tastes just like broccoli. And then we're also going to maybe consider, I don't know how adventurous we're going to be this year, but sugarcane is something you can also grow that you can even overwinter here. If you plant it in the ground, you can get yourself some mulch and cover that sugar cane every year, chop it down to the base, cover that, and it'll come back every year. So um, I bet you didn't know that. I bet you guys didn't know that. Uh, I'm also going to grow artichokes here in Zone 7. bet you didn't know that either. There is some artichokes that are actually perennial in Zone 7. Some will maybe do well in Zone 6, but it's unlikely. They need a long season, so it's important to kind of start these guys early. And even if they are perennial, I may not want them to be perennial because I may want to give them a head start. I'm not sure. We'll see how the season goes. But green globe artichokes are the name of the variety you guys want to look for. And they'll produce these smaller heads. Not so many, but they will produce them in the first year, and they will be more tender than other varieties of artichoke. So pretty cool. This is a big experiment for me this year. I did see them at Longwood Gardens for those of you who are in the Kennett Square, Pennsylvania area and have been there. It's very beautiful. They have these green globe artichokes in their experimental, um, not experimental, but uh, educational vegetable patch that they have every year. Um, some other things we're going to grow this year. We talked a lot about squash in my last episode of Fruit Talk. We're going to do patty pan squash, spaghetti squash, butternut squash, and sweet dumpling. We're going to grow these guys here vertically. The patty pan squash is kind of low growing, a smaller size uh, zucchini size plant, but it's smaller. And then spaghetti squash, we're going to let this one roam. We're going to let this one go in every which way it wants to go trying to get as many spaghetti squashes as we can and we're gonna make a lot of potato latkes out of the spaghetti squash I think it would be a really nice texture uh, for a potato laka. you never know uh, butternut squash sweet dumpling we're gonna be doing a lot of potential stuffing we're gonna make desserts out of the butternut squash and we're going to roast both of them the patty pan squash is really great for stuffing uh, we're also going to grow corn this year, and we're doing like a nice little three sisters Native American type, type planting where you guys get the corn, the beans up the corn, and on the outside of the corn is the squash. But on the outside of my corn is going to be different things, and we're going to see how well that goes together, but that's what we're going to do. In between the corn, we're going to have things like eggplant. Ping Tong is an Asian variety of eggplant that does well here and it has a, a thinner, less flesh, more skin, which makes it a better variety for sauteing in a pan or for grilling. Um, whereas you got things like your diamond-shaped eggplants, your big Italian-type eggplants, those are great for um, stuffing or potentially uh, making eggplant parm, which I love to make and love to eat. But this year we're gonna go with a slender, Asian variety of eggplant and see how well that one does on the stovetop and the grill. Jimmy Nardello and Carmen are two peppers that I I, uh, I dug up this year. You can go watch the video of me talking about how I dug them up and how I'm overwintering them in my house upstairs. These guys will then be planted out as really strong plants that have a great head start to them and they'll put out a really great set of peppers for me and we'll actually get quite big. I normally designate one square foot per pepper plant, but these I'm giving them a bit more room. The eggplant here, we're gonna let that one grow vertically as well. A lot of this stuff in this bed I haven't mentioned yet, but all of this is going to be grown vertically. 
we are going to grow them up poles, EMT poles. If you guys saw my videos this year at all, you will see that a lot of my stuff is being grown vertically. Why? To save space for more production, for more disease resistance. I mean, every single thing is letting me believe that growing vertically is better. So, again, the butternut squash, sweet dumpling vertically, ping tongue vertically. We'll probably select two different shoots from the eggplant and let them grow up the pole as high as we can get them. These poles, by the way, are eight feet tall. About two to, one to two feet of that is in the ground. So in total, about eight to nine feet is above ground for these things to grow on. Um, we'll keep them mainly as single stem plants, prune them so that we're limiting the number of fruit, we're supporting the fruit. In the case of melons, you may have to do that. These are all smaller sized melons, musk melons or cantaloupe. We did a whole video on fruit talk about talking about all the different melons I'm gonna grow this year, all heirloom varieties. Even watermelons, things that are smaller in size that can grow vertically and have a melon hang from the plant without problems. I did it this year. I did videos on that. You guys can go back and watch that. It was beautiful to see. It's amazing. Melons are exceptionally good. I will be taking them very seriously, almost as serious as I take my figs this year. So we've got um, lots of different melons again. We're also doing cucumbers, and we're going to do them vertically this year as well. We grew about six lemon cucumbers this year vertically, and they did exceptional other than the uh, Fusarium wilt. And Fusarium wilt is a soil-borne disease that I'm hoping in this particular bed here that I showed you guys, this bed here along the house has shown zero Fusarium wilt, and I hope to keep it that way. And I hope that because this location is really has a lot of organic material in it, we got a lot of um, sunlight drying the plants, hopefully that soil borne disease will not become too big of a problem. But we've got the National Cucumber, an heirloom for pickling, and we've got the Boothby, Boothby's Blonde Cucumber, which is an heirloom for fresh eating and snacking. Um, realistically, I had six I had six cucumber plants last year, and I don't really need that many. I've learned over the years that, you know, try to grow as many as you can, and then dial that back over the years to really fit your needs. If I'm growing these things vertically, I only need three of them. They're more productive that way for the amount of space that they're in, and uh, they just do phenomenally well, I find. So I'm not, a, you know, a huge cucumber eater, but I love to eat pickles, and this is exactly what they're gonna be for. The rest of this whole entire bed is going to be dedicated to tomatoes. I love tomatoes. We've talked a lot about tomatoes. I've gone through the books, guys. I've gone through the books. Uh, I've talked about many varieties of tomatoes. I was going to get the books for you, but they're under a whole pile of things. I'm not going to worry about it. Epic Tomatoes is one uh, book that I read and another by Amy Goldman that we've talked at great length about these tomatoes. Um, we're going to grow up tomatoes for sauce for paste we're going to grow tomatoes for slicing big beefsteak tomatoes you see here we're going to grow cherry tomatoes as you see here and we're going to grow the mid-size um kind of round mid-size about a uh, how many ounces would those be i don't know but you know what i'm talking about they're more like salad type tomatoes about you know about this big about the size of a tennis ball or the size of a softball softball is a pretty good eh, maybe a softball is too big but basically that's what i'm talking about and these varieties i said been very carefully selected a same thing with the melons all of this i put a lot of research into and i'm really happy with what i've got here I know where everything's gonna go. I know what spacing it's all gonna go at. I know how many plants I can fit in here. It's gonna be beautiful. And a lot of this stuff I'm going to direct seed. Whatever's highlighted in gray, it's really important to know. Um, this, The peppers here are not gonna be direct seeded. They're gonna be direct planted. I already have the plants, so I don't need to start seeds. But I know exactly what I need to start seeds for and what I don't. It's really this simple. Um, I may need to go in here and highlight some more things or unhighlight some more things. Some of this stuff in here we need to do a little bit more research on, but all this is really, really simple. And in fact, this whole bed here is going to be direct seeded. 
So anyway, guys, those are my plans for the garden. I got some really interesting things coming in, a lot of things to talk about for next year. I hope you guys, uh, I'm going to show you guys how I'm direct seeding this stuff or yeah, I'll show you guys how I direct seed it in the garden next year. We're going to have some row covers, some season extension type things, but we're also going to have them in this closet here with my fig cuttings. We are going to show you guys how I'm starting them from seed indoors, that whole process. If anybody has any suggestions as to what I should grow in addition to what you guys see here, um, let me know. I'm still open to options here. I'm still going to be doing more research, maybe even changing a couple things. But if you guys are really interested in what I'm going to grow, it's always in my spreadsheet. Go in here, make a copy of how I'm doing this, put it into your own spreadsheet. It's very, very simple. File, make a copy, and you can copy this into your own spreadsheet and use this as your own. So thank you guys for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed this one. Catch you off for the next one. Take care.